so there's a performance chapter in Mastering Shiny that we covered when um, when me and Federico when when we did Mastering Shiny uh, book club. Um, there's a couple of additional tools mentioned in chapter 14 of um, the engineering uh, production grade Shiny apps. Um, and the the tools that are mentioned have a kind of wider scope than uh, a lot of the things that were mentioned by Hadley in Mastering Shiny. Um, so, so this isn't just about optimizing your R code and um, the, uh, you know, kind of gains that you can get from um, caching within Shiny and, and, and things like that. Uh, there's additionally quite a bit of content about, um, oh, hold on, tools for profiling, or about um, a kind of profiling web apps more generally than, than simply, uh, than, you know, uh, so this is, uh, the, the thing that's mentioned towards the end of this chapter, Google Lighthouse is a tool that you could apply to, um, a, you know, any, any given website. Um, and it, um, it, it was quite neat. I, 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 I've never used it before. So it was quite a neat, um, tool for me to have a look at. And I, I, I ran it over an app that I'm currently working on and, uh, uh, let's just say it wasn't optimal, um, but uh, yeah. So, so this is the start of a, a, another section of the book, and this is like the the final section of the book on. Um, it, it says it's on optimizing, but I think it's more kind of generally about making um, um, web apps that people want to come back to. Um, so, basically, you know. If if you're trying to uh, develop some app and it takes 30 seconds before your users can click to the part of that app that they're interested in, they'll probably never use it again. Um, and things that uh, may be responsible for for that kind of um, you know the time lags that might put people off using your app or the um, other kind of usability concerns that you might that might come through you know if, if people are working on a, it sorry if people are looking at your app from a mobile device they they might have a smaller memory availability and things like that than than on a if they're working on a desktop um if your app imposes demands on network availability and, and um and um, uh, a kind of a continued connection to a, a server or something like that, then that can also put constraints on 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 which users are likely to um, successfully use your app. The final two chapters of this whole section are on um, web technologies that will be useful it, it to make your app more usable, more um, um, kind of, um, I don't know what you'd say. I mean, CSS to make it prettier and everything, but it's not just about kind of the styling of your app. There's, there's also concerns about, you know, how, um, how accessible it is for people and things like that. So, so these all kind of bundled together in a section called optimizing but really it's about kind of you know once your app goes out into the wider world um will people want to use it and 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 what kind of checks you can perform how you can write in a particular way to ensure that it's a, 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 a an if it an efficient app that people might want to come back to anyway this um First thing, uh, the first chapter, um, the need for optimization, is is uh, the the first section is a kind of um, hold your horses, everyone type thing. 
So, um, you know, uh, if 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 you've developed a shiny app, there will be functions, there will be modules, there will be um, you know, uh, it may be pulling data from some distant server and things like that. And um, you might think while you're coding the app or once you've released the app or something like that, you may think, well, I'm a, my app's a bit slow, but um, maybe, it's, maybe it's process X that's slowing it all up and spend loads of time trying to make process X be that a function or a uh, you know some reactive thing within in shiny trying to improve that but then there may be the the issue is you can't assume um, that you know what is causing your app to be slow or memory hungry or things like that without measuring and um, um, this first chapter I, I found quite quite interesting to be honest. It, it's um, so um, the, the the first thing that 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 is highlighted is that you know if you've only got half the features that are critical to the working of of your app, you shouldn't spend your time trying to optimize what's already present in your app. You should try to um, fill out the features that are necessary for the releasable version of the app and then find things that need optimizing within that more full featured thing. Um, so um, the learning objectives of this chapter are there are various things that you can optimize for, for speed and for memory and, and things like that. But more importantly, the, the authors highlight throughout this is that it's the maintainability and the readability of your code that you should be striving to optimize if if you're working on a team of you know multiple developers because um, if you write in some esoteric way um, it may be harder for a developer to come on and fix your code if there are inevitable bugs or it is um, that you know if it needs extending or something like that um and another thing that is um highlighted is that when you're when you're trying to improve the um the uh the the, the working of your app make sure you've measured things and make sure um if you have multiple implementations of the same uh function say you you've got um one implementation that uses dplyr and one that uses data.table um make sure you have either tests or benchmarks or something like that that can ensure that when you are comparing a, a, a one more efficient solution to your existing solution, make sure that they return exactly the same values and things like that. Because it's very easy to optimize code by breaking the code. Um, anyway, let's move on. So the, so the first section of the book is um, build first, then optimize. So this is identifying um, um, places within your app where it will be most valuable for you to spend your time optimizing. Um, so uh, what have we got here? Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yes, so if, if there's a lot of working parts in an app and um, if you, you can go down a rabbit hole of trying to optimize relatively small portions of that app which won't necessarily make a noticeable impact on the app as a whole and um, my kind of um, uh, reading of that is basically that you know if your furniture takes two months to come across the ocean 
when it arrives, it doesn't really matter whether you've got an electric screwdriver or just a handheld one, um, because the main thing that will delay the building of that furniture is the two months it takes to cross the ocean, not the, you know, 20 minutes versus two hours it might take uh, when the furniture arrives. So really, um, it's important to know um, where to spend your time um and also you 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 won't necessarily know what they, they refer to these as bottlenecks these are parts of the app that actually do cause your app to be um slower for you know for um for your users um it's important to measure and find those points and not just spend your time on something that won't have a, a, a an appreciable impact um so uh if we go back here i think there's a picture so this is a a picture of a bottleneck and basically it's you know you might have two three lanes of a road here and then as you get to this part of the road it's all reduced down to a single track and it's this narrowing of the road that means that cars that were riding at you know 60 miles an hour here are now driving at 30 here and it's finding these points where um the um th th these points in your app that slow it down for your users um they're the bits that you should be optimizing not just every you know you shouldn't be spending your time trying to find any bit of code that can be sped up um da, 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 da. right um so there's there's one thing that they <laughs> yeah so they keep highlighting this like every function that you've ever written could be made better could be faster could be more memory efficient and things like that but um yeah if you've only got 30 days available to build an app or to for, for the maintenance of an app or something like that should you really spend five days on something that won't that will make a fraction of a second difference in the typical use case um probably you 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 shouldn't really there's an example here um if um so uh if something takes um da, 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 if something takes 300 seconds to perform on your app when it you know when a, a user logs in and they click something some aspect of that app takes three you know five minutes to run now during running that part of the app a function a is ran once and it takes 30 seconds to cut to, to run and there's a function b that's called 50 times and it takes one second so it, in all b is taking 50 seconds to complete and a is taking 30 seconds to complete so is it better to um try to double the speed of function a or function b and really no matter how if if you can you know assuming you're capable of doubling the speed of these two functions your time may be better spent trying to speed up b because doubling its speed would save you 25 seconds whereas doubling a's speed will only save you 15 seconds so it's important to measure things find um well, I mean, if this is a, a, a process that takes 300 seconds anyway, it's important that you identify those parts of the app that um, are slow. And then once you've found them, identify the bits within them that, um, that will gain you the most speed if, if speed is what the issue is. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I think I had a, a, a misreading of this when I wrote these original notes. But I, yeah, so I was thinking that, you know, if A is a function and then B is called subsequent to A, 
if A is the thing that holds everything else up, then nothing can proceed until A is completed, regardless of, you know, the, the, so uh, to me, it, it didn't seem so clear cut that like speeding up B would always be better than speeding up A. So if A is a process that holds up everything else, maybe it's important to speed up A and then try and kind of incrementally uh, use B or something, I don't know. Anyway, um, yes, so um, so this is about measuring, but it's also important that when you do find code that needs optimizing or that is holding up your app, um, you, you shouldn't rewrite stuff in such a way that makes it difficult to read, difficult to navigate, difficult to maintain. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not a C programmer and I have, uh, when I initially started programming, when I was like a bench scientist in 2000, um, I started learning C++. I have forgotten everything I learned. Um, but yes, you could rewrite R code in a lower level language like C or C++. But if you did that and I was on your team, I wouldn't be able to fix that code. So you make the maintenance a burden upon yourself if you make um, the, the source code of your app such that your colleagues can't work, can't work on it or can't work on it to the same speed that you can. Um, yeah, um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, so tip, this is kind of, it, but it's quite common though. Like, so, I mean, it, it, people always want to write faster things. In bioinformatics, though, over the past few years, there's been a move to try and write as, write, rewrite a lot of tools in Rust because it's, you know, a lower level, faster, more kind of, memory safe language than some other languages that, that were more typical to to write these things and then a, a, a lot of the kind of pipelines that are used in bioinformatics are memory intensive and take hours to run so any speed gains are valuable um but yeah uh anyway um if if the if you're speeding up an app that is not, you know, doesn't really need it, you're probably wasting your time and you could spend your time better elsewhere. Um, so, yes, another thing they keep highlighting is that there's a trade off with optimization because you'll spend hours improving, you know, there'll, there'll be many hours involved in every doubling of the 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 efficiency of your app um and doing that may introduce bugs um and it may make it harder to reason about why the app crashes when it inevitably does um so is it always worth it um yeah so this is some code it's a c plus plus code but written within r so this this package RCPP is um, uh, was was released by Dirk Edelbertel, um, and is kind of the the standard way to write C plus plus from within R. Um, this function computes the mean of a vector of numbers, um, as does this single command in R. Uh, so just calling mean, it's already written for you. You can just call it as is. Mean CPP to get that thing running, working required someone to sit down and write it and, and whatnot. Although, you know, computing the mean isn't uh, a, an odious task. Um, there will be other, to, to rewrite a more general function might be more complicated in, in, in C++. But um, uh, 
So this tool here, ben, uh, sorry, the package is called Bench and the function within it is Mark. So when you write it out in the code, it looks like Bench Mark. Um, you can run that and what it will do is a thousand different times, it will run this command and it will run this command. It will measure the uh, length of time it took to, 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 to compute the mean by the two different um, functions, then, you know, do various different summary statistics and things like that. And also ensure that the values returned are always identical. Um, so this is a way of benchmarking that a new, newly written function behaves the same as a pre-existing function. And we can see that by rewriting that code in C++, it's twice as fast. But if you only ever call that function once in the, you know, in your workflow or in your app or whatever, is it worth spending the extra half an hour it might take you to write a bespoke C++ function to compute the mean when it will only actually save you 0.2 of a second? Uh, no, not even that, sorry. Um, uh, 0.2 of a millisecond. Um, sorry, um, orders of magnitude out. That's why I never became a physicist. Um, right, uh, so um, yeah, I'll go back to my notes. So, um, so the, yeah, there's lots of different ways of restructuring your code. And there's a trade-off in a lot of a lot of these different choices. So the, the thing we just illustrated there was rewriting some high level code from R in a lower level language. There was a slight increase in speed, but the um, maintenance burden and the time it took to write the initial function may be such that it's a, a, a waste of your time to do that. Um, you could additionally, you could rewrite your code like earlier I was mentioning dplyr and data table, which do similar kind of, have, have similar responsibilities within the R ecosystem. Um, so you could rewrite dplyr um, code to use data table in the back end. Um, and similarly, you could rewrite to take advantage of, of like, um, parallel computing or, or something like that. Every one of these restructurings requires a cost, it, it invokes a cost, be it in maintainability, be it in terms of finding people to join your team who are fluent in those uh, technologies and things. Um, yes, so we've done that example. Um, the next thing, this is uh, the, the larger section of this um, is about profiling um, R code. And then there's a section about profiling Shiny and then there's a section about uh, profiling uh, web applications more generally. Um, so do I have some code here? Yeah, uh, so where did I put my R Studio thing? Um, just trying to ensure that I get the right one. Um, okay, so we've got two different implementations of something here. Oh no, that's that's a slightly different thing. Where am I? Um, benchmarking R code. Okay, so um, so I'll, I'll kind of illustrate using um, benchmark here. Um, that's the reason my R Studio is off the bottom of my screen. Right, um, you can see my um, cursor, can't you, at the bottom of the screen there? Um, so if we copy this code over, oops, what have I done here? If I copy that code. Here. And I copy that code here. So we've got a for loop, and what it will do is it will make a vector of a particular size, 
and then it will um, multiply each position in that vector by 10 and then store that value inside the vector uh, in, in, in the, the, the index position of that vector. So it will create a vector that is like 10, 20, 30, 40, up to whatever size you want. Similarly, there's a vectorized version of the same and vectorization is, is a really neat way in R of speeding up some code because it pushes, um, it pushes it, it pushes code from the R level into the C level such that C does all the work and then you know you you end up with less to write within the R um, and like vectorizing is is kind of a, a really neat way of speeding up code now benchmark we're going to use that to check that the for loop when run a thousand times returns the same values as the vectorized thing and, ugh. Um, oh, have I? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm doing the uh, the example from the end of the chapter before the example at the start. Um, but yeah, so this is using a, a package called Bench, and if we pull Bench up, it's quite a nice package. Um, uh, bench. Um, there'll be a website for this because it's an R studio thing, I think. There. Um, yeah, so it's quite it's quite nice. So the the when you run bench, it returns with a table that looks like this, where you get the minimum, medium, and blah blah blah. Um, so that's for benchmarking code. There's also a tool called Bench Press, which is uh, where you have a range of parameters and say two functions or three functions or something like that. And you want to check that for each combination of parameters, each of those functions returns the same value and also compare um those the you know the speed and the memory efficiency of those functions so that will give you so for example with that you can compare how long it takes to do 10 100 a thousand ten thousand iterations of some process with um a vectorized or a for loop approach or something like that um so have i installed yeah okay so this is using um the benchmark tool if we run that here so comparing a for loop and a vectorized version of the same we end up with a um table that looks like this it tells you that um on a typical case the for loop took 25 times longer than the vectorized form of the same thing um and uh, the total time performed is, uh, you know, about 14 times greater for the for loop than the vectorized thing. Now that's just for um, for the for loop with a thousand. Um, the vec if we change that to say 10,000, it might take a bit longer, but it will still be. Um, It didn't take appreciably longer. Um, so now we're talking kind of 15 fold difference. So it's a similar kind of um, gain from using vectorized versus for loop stuff. But finding code that that is worth optimizing in this way is um, more of a challenge. Um, so here there's an example in the book where they take one function top that calls another function middle and then middle calls uh, two different functions bottom a and bottom b um, and oh i might as well check that i've got uh, um, 
uh, yes, I'm fairly certain I've got it installed, yeah. Um, so if we copy this code over, um, yeah, and each of these functions has a kind of pause uh, call in it so that it should take half a sec, this should take half a second, this should take two seconds and whatnot. And the purpose of this is to show you how to profile code using a tool called profviz, um, which it'll take a few seconds to run. So what we've got there is, so profviz, you put in the function that you want to profile here and when it's shiny, that could be your run app function in there. Um, so we've got top, which calls middle, um, and middle calls bottom A first, and then bottom B. And then after a couple of pauses, you return back to, mid to middle and then to top, and then return to profits at the end. What this um graph shows this is time proceeding from left to right these are function calls the bottom function calling the next function up the next function up calling and you know on and on and on um so long as these are long running enough functions you'll be able to um identify when each one's running but there is a bit of randomness so for functions that run very quickly um you might miss them because it it what what happens when profviz runs is it kind of polls every fraction of a second which function is running at the moment and kind of those. anyway um so if we look at um is there a, there's usually a way of looking at the code yeah so um you can also look at the the this so that's the flame graph representation um this is the uh for each of the functions that were called how long it took for them to run so there's not really any difference in terms of memory usage they all used barely anything um top took about three seconds to run middle took about three seconds to run bottom b took two seconds and bottom a took half a second and whatnot and so this is a way of profiling your uh, your code um I mean, probably i, I know it, it's not like um uh where am i hold on i'll just pull this over here so that you don't see anything gone toward um but um so this is an app I'm working on at the moment. And um, so if I show you here, this is a profviz thing where what I did was I, I called Shiny's run app function within profviz. Uh, so it's like the code used is profviz of Shiny bang bang run app. Um, and what this highlights is that there's a, a kind of lot, this is the, the time taken before the app is in a usable state where the, you know, the, the user can click about and look at the graphs that they're interested in and stuff. And it all looks fine until you realize that this here, so that's what, 30 seconds to 60 seconds, this here is a single function taking 30 seconds to run. It's not a um, network issue or anything like that. That's um, pure data manipulation. Um, and it's actually computing something that's probably irrelevant to most users of the app. So this could actually be converted into a reactive value or something like that, such that that computation is only done for people who want to see that aspect of the app or it could be rewritten such that you know there's a a vectorized version that could be done which 
um, might need a bit of um, testing and debugging to do, but it would take a fraction of the 30 seconds that it takes here and probably clear up a lot of memory usage. But that's like something from my everyday world. Um, uh, but I might show you, I, I'm not going to show you any of the source code associated with that app, but, I, um, but yeah, so this tool, um, ProfViz, is quite useful for finding functions within your app or your package or whatever that take a long time to run. And once you've found those, um, benchmark can be used to compare alternative implementations of that function um, and to check that, you know, your time spent optimizing the code was worth worth doing. Um, uh, where did I put my book? No, it's there. Okay, so um, there is another tool called ProfMem and ProfViz I think wraps around ProfMem. So those, um, so that profile I showed you. Here, the memory usage here, um, I think is taken by polling the, the results from running ProfMem. And as you know, memory is also an issue. Um, so, it, you know, if it costs you thousands of pounds to run your app on a, um, a, a kind of instance which has tons of gigabytes available, but you can rewrite your code so that it runs in less than a gigabyte of RAM, then you'll probably be able to save thousands of pounds for your clients or for yourself. Or whatever. Um, Yes, sorry, I, co I covered the benchmarking R code as the first part of this, but yes, so I just wanted to illustrate that bench, the package bench is useful for comparing different implementations and for comparing, you know, how those implementations vary as you vary the size of the data set or the contents of the data set that, upon which your, your, your functions run. When you're using, um, golem based apps the the authors recommend that you use um so when you to use profviz while running an app um you should wrap golem's run app function inside a print call whereas what i did when i was um so to generate the the profiles that I showed you from my working life, I ran the code like this. And that just, it starts up the app running, you can click about or whatever you need to do and then stop and it will generate this profile. Um, the, the authors of Gollum recommend that rather than run sub, oh no, sorry, it's this would be a function that you define yourself for your own app. Um, rather than writing the code like that, where you just where you include your run app function inside profits, they recommend that you wrap it in a print call so that um, so that it forces the app to run. Um, anyway. I, I didn't quite understand why uh, it was necessary to uh, wrap the that that function in that way. Um, yes, I, so the the next section, um, profiling shiny. Yes, um, so if you if you want to profile shiny, um, you can use profviz in the same way as, as, as described there for a more general function. Um, and, and similarly, you can use benchmark on the functions that your Shiny app depends upon. For front-end issues, there's a tool called Google Lighthouse, um, which is 
um, a uh, it's a, a kind of web performance type. It, it generates a report on how uh, kind of usable, how efficient, and things like that your web apps are. So this would apply if you'd written your app in React or in Flask or in in any number of different uh, web development um, settings beyond Shiny. Um, so if we, um, what was it again? There's an online version of Hexmake. Um, 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 I think there's is it that one. Yeah. So if I run um, this tool, Google Lighthouse. Now I, uh, it's made available. If I hold on, if I new on, it recommends to use an incognito window rather than a um, a more general web browser uh, window, and that is presumably so that, like you know, any cookies that you've got saved, any um, CSS or JavaScript files or something that you've got cached in your web browser don't influence the speed at which this um, uh, the, at which the app that you're testing um, runs. So we can go into uh, developer tools. I'm using Chromium here. Oh, right. Okay. So that's already. Um, so this is um if i just show you what it looks like originally so um this is the chromium the the dev tools so you can open this up using um more tools developer tools then um there's a, a range of different tools you can use for checking the memory usage and, and things like that. And then there's this thing, Lighthouse, that's mentioned in the Gollum book. Um, so if we check how well this would run if it was on a mobile device, we can do that like this. And what it will do, so I clicked the generate report thing there. It's testing how fast the app loaded um how fast uh, so performance is does it give me any kind of indication of what that means so um so this is it took four seconds to um get some things up on the screen on on that kind of it mocked up mobile browser. Um, I don't know quite what some of these things are, to be honest, but um, let's look at accessibility. So, um, uh, so there are a variety of things that you probably wouldn't even think about as a shiny developer in here that have been flagged up as things that might improve the um accessibility of your app so you know if i mean this is written in english so you might want to put a, a language attribute in with the, the the kind of shiny header code to um indicate that it's a um the the language of the website is english um let's have a see what else is there that we can test performance access best practices. Um, there's a couple of um, kind of security issues identified and there's the the app is using some JavaScript libraries that are known to have some vulnerabilities. But overall, I mean, the app is got, you know, 70 plus percent for all of these things. Now, if I pull out um, um, what, where are we? Uh, here, if, no. Uh, oh. Oh. 
so many things now. Right, actually, I'll go into my, uh, so the public version of it. Right, I'm going to pull this over here. Right, so this is an app I'm working on at the moment. And as you can see, it's pretty slow. Um, so what's going on there is it's reading in a bunch of data in order that it can generate some tables and figures and things like that. Someone else wrote the bulk of the app. I'm just kind of uh, like maintaining it over time. Um, so here we can go into, oh, hold on. If I do this from a, because they recommended to do it from an incognito window, we'll do that instead. Uh, and close that, then um, we can do this developer tools thing. I'll run it as if it's running on a desktop so that it's more similar to to my own experience of working with the app than, than kind of the, the mobile version of the same. And it's currently, it's working out how long all these things take then it will probably be ticking over over various other things at the moment. Then it will write a report that you'll be able to view in here. And that report, you can actually extract. Um, you can extract. Oh, sorry, I've got so many copies of the same thing. Um, Nope. Um, hex make, that'll be the one. Um, yeah, so, so the, the purpose of this tool is to identify things like security issues, speed issues, um, uh, kind of accessibility issues. And to me, it was like a lot of the things that were being highlighted on the um, app itself were not things I'd really considered even looking at. Um, so, I mean, we're not quite as good at, to be honest, I think it behaved a bit poorly, more poorly earlier on. Um, so there's a few resources in here that are, are taking up a lot of uh, time, but I don't, you know, I'm not sure that minifying a JavaScript file or something like that would be the thing that speeds up this app. The main thing that, that needs to be done to speed it up is some actual R code. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's taking, 20, 30, 40 seconds before it becomes usable to a user. You have to be able to tease out whether that's an issue at the front end of your app, whether it's an issue with the uh, server side code being inefficient, whether it's an issue with you trying to pull in too much data at any one time, or whether it's an issue whereby you are, um, you know, where, where you could like use shiny's built-in support for kind of caching of things um to improve your app um but yeah I, so that's I, di I didn't write any notes on that final section of the thing but it was quite a neat tool that i i hadn't used before um and um yeah i don't know i mean i thought it was quite neat um yes the the json data if you run this tool lighthouse from the command line so there's like a you know there's a, a kind of javascript program that can run it against your um, app the the json file that you've that that generates you can analyze within r um, so for example you can pull out things like the speed of of various things and the um, and that um but yeah it was it was neat but i don't really want to go into the uh the, the kind of inner details of the um of of the kinds of things that it reports um 
yeah uh, so anyway so that's basically the content of the, the chapter i've not gone into too much detail over that thing at the very end but there there is some further information about kind of when it's valuable to do things like minifying your css files and your javascript files which if shiny is the point at which you've dipped your toes into web application those kind of concerns are probably not something that you really even knew about before you were working on Shiny. And um, so it's important that, that these kind of things are highlighted. And, and certainly that kind of, you know, front end uh, concerns uh, with the, the efficiency of your app is, isn't something that's covered in the, the um, performance chapter of, of Mastering Shiny to, from, from, my, from memory at least. Um, but yeah, yeah, I thought it was quite, quite, quite interesting. The next chapter, um, there's some stuff about um, reactivity and, and, and data access and things like that, um, which we'll possibly talk about next week if, if, if either of you would like to, um, to cover that. Um, there are other chapters within this section on kind of... Um, optimizing shiny code there, there's trouble is i thought these chapters were much shorter than they actually are and i don't know whether they've been bulked out since we started the uh the book club but i'm sure i could i i thought when we i was looking through it that i'd be able to get through one or two of these chapters in a given week and it's a bit uh it's not quite the um not quite how it's panned out hopefully that was interesting though because um i i, I don't know i mean a lot of kind of optimization stuff is you can easily get trapped in the weeds and waste your time doing stuff that will have a, a, a marginal gain but sometimes using these tools that are there to profile and optimize it is pro profile and benchmark your code and once you've run those and, and kind of optimized your code they can have a significant gain on your apps when used in uh when used conservatively um but yeah the main take home from the chapter is that the main thing you should be optimizing for is the ability of your colleagues to work on code that you've written and um beyond that if you can get efficiency gains and things like that without sacrificing maintainability um then that's a perfectly reasonable endeavor um Federica, i may be making a rhetorical comment or a, a rhetorical question as a whole but by default just starting a shiny app it is not a bloated application right no, it's extremely no. minimal there's not a lot of when you render it or you run the app it's not compiling into a vast amount of extra content that has to be interacted with CSS, JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera. So would it, would it mean, or if I imply that you access your BSLib uh, uh, point, the bootstrap uh, concepts, would it imply that that would be a easy area to start adding additional bloat to performance of your app? Um, I'm looking at styling as as a case and and really where i'm I'm coming from this question or this detail is if you use particular authoring platforms outside of our studio or outside and you're developing web services, just starting an application or a project automatically just adds this huge quantity of we're just going to package it for you just in case you need it but it doesn't really have an effect on whatever it is you're producing. Um, a classic case of the question I'm asking is if you start a Microsoft Word document, just all you have to do is open the app and then save the file. Automatically, you've got a kilobyte of data stored on your memory hmm. that you'll never use, you'll never need. You've got a yeah. blank canvas. There's no text on that file. It's just all of the extra content that comes along with. Shiny's not like that, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And the only thing that I would think would start adding to that performance possibility would be the BS lib. But I want to be yeah, careful yeah. as I'm stating that because I don't want it to imply to any 
viewer of this uh, a recording that that would be a, a, a possibility. Sure, sure. But but certainly, I, I mean, I, I I'm I'm not a particularly experienced web developer, but I do know that there's there's tools they call them tree shaking tools, where if there are aspects of a um, a kind of styling library that that you aren't using in your app, they can be stripped away and generate a, a smaller set of um, static files for for use with your app. Um, I I don't know of uh, I don't know whether those whether the it's so valuable to to learn how to do that kind of stuff with a shiny app at, at, at present because to my to my mind like r is probably inefficient enough that it will always be the um the the what did he call it a uh, bottleneck um but i might be wrong um and and yeah i i think po possibly the worrying about the kind of front end efficiency is probably um uh premature for a lot of shiny apps um particularly if they do much data processing and and, and data access and stuff that there are efficient there are gains that you can make elsewhere that will um go beyond anything you could do with a um I've had a I've had a, a, a question bouncing in my brain for quite a few weeks now, um, and I don't I haven't found an answer to it directly yet. No. But in the sense of of the Apache web server versus Nginx web server, so this mm -hmm. this relationship between these two technologies, one is more efficient at doing X, while the other is more efficient at doing Y. Yeah. When you combine the two together, you get the best of both worlds. My question is, at the core of Shiny, what web service is our studio using, or what what is uh, what is Shiny using um, as its web socket? Do you know? Boy, I don't an actually to that? know. No, um, that is quite interesting. I, I may I, be, I have no idea. Well, I may be opening this up or confusing an actual uh, infrastructure for yeah. a web server versus what we're doing in a in a Shiny application. I may yeah. be asking too vague of a question, um, need more details surrounding it. Maybe that's why I haven't found the answer yet either. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, do, I, I don't know a great deal about the, the kind of underlying um, architecture that makes Shiny work. Correct. Um, one of the things that I, I just don't really have the time to, to do these kind of things now is like how you could make a... Um, slimmed down version of shiny that that runs from r and does the same kind of web app type stuff what web technologies would you need to know in order to implement something that you know all it might do is print a histogram of some data onto a um it, it, into a web browser or you know provide a interactive way to modify some data and, and what is the kind of smallest amount of web knowledge you would need in order to implement that without calling library shiny um but uh i have no idea and i imagine it is considerable <laughs> um, but yeah i don't know much about the uh what you know what um web server type stuff is goes on it like shiny apps.io or uh, underlies shiny server but uh. now that's a it's a great conversation and i'm sorry for opening a can of worms <laughs> at the end of a presentation uh, oh, of just a curiosity i've always had yeah, yeah. right cool anyway um uh, yeah. Oh. yeah please um i would be able to do the the next chapter if okay I'm brilliant to... okay yeah so yeah yeah the definitely next chapter, then i don't know what what's next 